I'm just touching on the some of the fish. I can't cover them all that you can find on the shores around the coast, but particularly those you would find in South Devon. Um, and so I just want to just this. Right. Um, and some of their biology and also a fair bit on identification. Right, so what is a fish? What's in the name? Obviously, got cuttlefish, crayfish, starfish, jellyfish, which aren't true fish. In fact, what is a true fish? So fish, a cold blooded animal with a backbone, gills, and usually fins, and a skin covered in scales that lives in water. There's one word in that uh, definition which is correct. All the rest do not apply to all fish. You can tell me which one is the only one that's true at the end. Uh, fish basically, um, I'll be saying look for this and that in terms of thing. So the elasma branks, um, usually five to seven gills, gill slits. Um, a hard, rough skin covered in dermal denticles, asymmetrical tail, usually two dorsal fins, pectoral pelvic, and most have an anal fin, but the, the dogfish don't. Then onto the more simple fish, um, like salmonids, one spinous, uh, well, one dorsal fin and a adipose, a fatty fin without any fin rays. Then anal fin, pelvic, pectoral. Uh, in technical terms, pelvic is often called ventral. So, and by now the gills are under cover of an operculum. A line of scales, in large scales along the side is called scoots, and quite often the um, dorsal is two fins, sometimes more, often often one, joined as one. So this is a ceranid, it's a grouper I happen to work on in the uh, Arabian Gulf, but on the dorsal fin, either there's two separate or often you get the first part with spines, which are fairly stiff pointed uh, ones, whereas the rays tend to be, um, oh, I had the word earlier, I've forgotten it again. Anyway, it's much softer with a splayed brush-like edge to them. So the rays are soft, spines are hard. So with the anal fin, often you get a couple, two to four, spines, sometimes separated, and then the main anal fin. Uh, pinching one member of the audience's system, Francis Dipper has come up with the expression phlegms to remind you of what to look for when looking at a fish. Fins, lateral line, eye, mouth, markings, shape. So here, fins, We've got uh, three dorsal fins, two anal fins, lateral line fairly well marked and curved, <coughs> uh, eye fairly large and above the end of the mouth. Mouth subterminal, quite strong mouth. This family often has barbels as do some other fi uh, families, but not all. Then you've got the uh, pectoral fins, pelvic fins. Markings here are um, just generally spotting, can be fairly yellowish, often quite green, or can be very dark. I've seen some almost black ones. And the general shape, well, it's a fairly typical fish shape, but it's not a bottom living one. It's as close to the bottom fish rather than Typical bottom fish. Of course, something very diff different in terms both of fins and shape and everything is something like this deep sea angler. 
but it wants us to concentrate on the shore fish today. So life on the shore. Hard, it's a hard life, a hard knock life, as I say in some picture. Varying amounts of immersion and immersion according to where you are on the shore. Immersion, how long you're underwater, immersion out of the water. The shore itself can be sheltered, exposed, and even on the same shore, different parts of it can be different in their exposure to wave action. So here we've got the south facing uh, sloping open rocks, whilst under here, that's sheltered and shaded. Salinity, well, so seawater, uh, 33.5 parts per thousand, or in the Mediterranean, 35 parts per thousand. What's the worry about with that? Well, even on the shore, if you have a hot day, you can actually sometimes see crystals of salt around the edge of a rock pool, showing you the salinity there is much higher than that. And on the other hand, on a lovely May day, the pool can double its volume with rainwater going in and the salinity can crash. So the animals living in those areas have to be able to cope with these um, aspects, these uh, varying conditions. As I was saying, the aspect of the shore, this is a south facing shore, therefore a lot of sun. The temperature on some of these open south facing bits can go up to almost 40 degrees. Of course, in winter, they could have snow on them down to zero. And even the rock pool can be getting pretty warm and pretty cold. And then on the shore, we're talking, looking at a rocky shore here, but don't forget there's lots of different ones. Straightforward rocky, there's the sub habitat of all the rock pools within it. And then sand shores, mud shores and deal grass. So there's our typical rocky. This actually is in Cornwall, down at Helston. And that's a shore to us. But to most fish, this is the shore. More than ha half the shore is underwater for half the time. And or lower down, it's only out of the water for a short time. So this jungle of thongweed, coatings of the rocks of the red algae, many of them calcareous encrusting algae. And it's a totally different world, a gorgeous one to snorkel through. On the other hand, very changeable salinity in an estuary with mixture of mud, gravel, patches of sand, and the seagrass beds. The flowering plants, they're not related to the grasses. They're a, flat, a flowering plant, and the only one you're going to find in... I hope that hasn't... I know what's going on there. Sorry. Try and get back. Sorry about that. Did you get that white out? I, uh, so it's the only <coughs> flowering plant found beneath the sea in Britain or most of Europe. And about uh, two or perhaps three species found in our waters. But quite an important habitat, a nursery ground for a lot of fish, a sheltered area for other fish, and also uh, quite a rich feeding area. So looking at rocky shore fish, the one you most people will find when they go down on the shore, the shanny or common blenny, and a very typical shore fish. It will stay on the shore throughout the tidal cycle. It doesn't have scales. It's got a moist, a thin skin, kept moist by mucus, and that allows it to do oxygen exchange through the skin when it's out of the water, providing it's still damp in a crevice or usually under weed, something of that sort, it can still do oxygen exchange through its skin. Big strong mouth, 
when I was looking at these at Dale, uh, I was finding they were mainly biting the barnacles off the rocks. Some of them don't bother actually the hard work of biting the whole barnacle. They'll just eat the siri, the legs, and uh, go around grazing on those. I don't know about barnacles, but I know that flounder can eat the siphons of some of the bivalves in the mud of estuaries and they'll regrow. So actually it grazes the siphons as a cow would graze the grass in the meadow. And it's quite possible the same happens with the blenny and the cereal of the barnacles. Uh, always say that the shanny is one of the few blennies that doesn't have tentacles. Of course, it doesn't have over the eyes, but it does have these fine ones around the nostrils. Same fish, same species, but the males tend to, particularly in breeding season, tend to go black with white uh, lips, particularly the maxilla, the upper the, um, lip, will often go white. I don't think they keep this all through the year. Uh, Paul Naylor probably better, a better, but normally tend to be the pattern we showed earlier. But in breeding season, males tend to be very dark and light lips. Our special little um, blenny of the area, well, not so little, a bit smaller than the shanny, but not that small. And named, of course, after one of my heroes, the like, local naturalist Montague, Colonel Montague, who moved down to uh, Kingsbridge with his companion in science and um, did a lot of observations around here, found lots of new species, proved that cell buntings occurred in Britain, things like that, and has several marine organisms, crabs, rays, named after him. Beautiful. The vet markings, like most blennies, can be variable, but these blue spots along the edge tend to be noticeable. But the most noticeable thing is instead of having a pair of tentacles, it's got a single tentacular plate between the eyes with this lovely frill edge to it. One blenny, which you probably won't find down here, if you do, please do let me know. There have been some found down here, but the eel pout of viviparous blenny is more generally a northern species. So more, more eel-like or snake blennyish in general shape uh, and more northern in distribution generally, but they are occasionally found in the southwest. If you've ever tried to pick up one of these, you'll know why it's called a butterfish. Uh, once again, like so many uh, rocky shore fish, it doesn't have scales. If it had scales, when squeezing between the rocks and things, if it caught a scale and ripped it off, it could cause injury to the skin, affecting its waterproofness, because these animals need to be waterproof to maintain their osmotic balance. Their bodies don't need to be as salty as the water around them. They've got to be waterproofed in a way. And the kidneys do a lot of the work, but also they need a waterproof skin and damage to the skin is harmful to them. Therefore having a smooth skin covered in mucus or slime is a much better strategy for living amongst rocks than scales. Um, and so when you try to pick up a butterfish, it slips out of your hands and you're a butterfingers. So the butterfish or gunnel, it's generally known in, in Britain, over in Scilly, is called the nine eyes or sometimes the ten eyes on the basis of the spots along the top of the back and up onto the, cord, onto the um, dorsal fin. Some people count them as uh, ten, some count them as nine often recognizable when it's in a crevice by this downward stripe through the eye, though a few other species also have that, so do be careful. Onto the gobies, 
people think Gobi is Blennies. Well, what's the difference? For a start, Blennies have a single continuous dorsal fin. Gobies have two separated ones. And going against what I've just said, you'll always find a fish to go against anything you say about fish. They have scales. Uh, the patterns of scales over the head can often be helpful in telling which uh, species it is. And also the actual genus Gobius, the upper rays of the pectoral fin are not held in the membrane. They are free. If you see that in a goby, it belongs to genus Gobius, which is mainly the larger, medium to large gobies. Lynn Baldock and uh, Paul Kay have done a marvellous study of uh, the gobies. They've shown that good, high quality digital imagery makes it very easy to identify, more much easier to identify. There's always one or two that are difficult, but their work has shown how much easier it is to identify. Uh, though this photo doesn't actually show the characteristic features of the black goby particularly well. Black goby, the first fin is much higher than the second and fairly sharp and has a black or dark blotch at the top upper front edge. And black gobies, they say, why is it called a black goby? And it's like that. Well, that's a black goby as well. Just look at that fin much higher at the front and with the dark blotch showing that is a black goby. Uh, black gobies tend to live in muddy habitats. I was walking down the Yelm, actually doing an oyster survey, and saw a rock over a bit of a pool. So I lifted it up, and on the underside of the rock was a load of eggs. Ah, that's interesting. Oh, well, it's a bit of pool under it. I couldn't see there was a pool there because it was all so muddy. Put my hand in, and there was a black goby. It was a male had made a nest in a hollow in the mud under the stone and was had the eggs on the underside of the stone and he was guarding them. The rock goby. These are both quite large gobies. They can go to 14 centimeters or more. Uh, people talk about giant gobies being up to 30 centimeters. Well, that's rather unusual. And in fact, most giant gobies are actually only in the eight to 14 centimeter size range. So similar sizes to these. But distinctive feature you get in the rock is that there's a pale edge to the first dorsal. It's not so elevated as in a rock goby, as in a black goby, sorry, but the upper edge of it is pale, usually yellowish. And in breeding season, that becomes bright orange, as you can see here in this one, how it's got bright orange and sometimes uh, red upper edge to the first dorsal. And here, we're seeing again, those free rays at the top of the pectoral fin, which shows it's the genus Gobius. <coughs> Here's the giant goby. <coughs> it is, of course, illegal to go um, collecting or even hunting for giant gobies without a permit from Natural England. However, if you don't know they're going to be there and you happen to find one, well, please let me know because their distribution was in um, 98, 2000, thought to be in, Brit in British water, UK water, <laughs> only the Scillies, south coast of Cornwall and Wembury with one sighting on the north coast. Since that time, people have got interested in them. Much more looking has been going on. They're now found almost the entire coast, south coast of Cornwall and several sites on the north coast. Um, so still, as far as I'm aware, only um, Wembury in Devon. They the books say they're found in upper shore rock pools with a lot of entomorpha. I've never found them in one of those. Sorry, I should say, say Olver now, shouldn't I? Change its name. A lot of green weeds in upper shore rock pools. We tend to find them in rock pools that are at least 80 centimetres deep. 
and when they can get under a ledge. Uh, distinctive features, they're chunky looking. They can go to 30 centimeters, but I say most of the ones that Wim Wheeler found in his research, and I think Knight Jones as well, were only in the eight to 12 centimeter range. This one's more like uh, 16 centimeters. Chunky, big bulbous, uh, bulky head, looking a bit of a bruiser, pepper and salt coloration. And the one thing I find helps distinguish them, this white edge to the dorsal, caudal and anal fins. So second dorsal, not on the first dorsal, second dorsal, caudal, anal fins have that white edge, which is pretty distinctive. Uh, also, the pectoral disc, sucker-like disc, but has these little pointed wings on the front edge of it in the giant goby. As I say, uh, you mustn't go deliberately hunting them, but if you do come across them, please let me know. Uh, when I was carrying out a survey over on Scilly, we were getting a lot of large gobies, and I was trying to find uh, giant gobies, and I was never quite certain. Now I've seen in Cornwall several, I know these aren't, but this one is a big one, 14 centimetres. It could be a rock goby, but it hasn't really got the... That, that, that thing. Sometimes you have to say, well, without very detailed examination in the lab, you're not going to know. No, possibly if I'd done a scale count, but I, I hate doing scale counts, or one or two other looking at it in the lab, I might have been able to identify it. But I can just put it down as large, gobious. And on the rocky shore, the other goby you might find is this beautiful little one, one of the smaller ones, uh, the two spot. I, whenever I see them, they live particularly amongst the kelps. Whenever I see them, they always tend to be at an angle, sometimes head down, sometimes head up. I presume they can sp uh, swim horizontally, but I never seem to see them like that. I have found these when I've been hunting around at low water um, inside the holdfasts of the uh, fur bellows, that great big rugby ball type uh, base of the kelp. So broken, breaking one of those open with a friend who was looking for worms and we found small clingfish and uh, two spot gobies inside one of those. One of the commonest fi uh, fish on the shore, but also quite a spectacular one the long-spined sea scorpion, quite ferocious looking, very spiny, but perfectly harmless. Uh, they can often be told from other species you'll find down here by that little white barbel in the corner of the mouth. The Norwegian uh, bullhead has the same. So if you're up in the north, uh, it could, uh, that's not uh, guaranteed. That the Norwegian bullhead also has thorns along its back. Um, these are extremely variable <coughs> in coloration. Looking through my pictures, selecting some, I found some bright yellow ones, I found some blue ones, a lot of red ones, and this one. Beautifully. Beautifully camouflaged against the lithophamnia and the uh, encrusting algae covered rocks and with patches of sponge. Amazing. Also, with the um, long spine sea scorpion, in the breeding season, I haven't found it outside the breeding season, the male has a quite prominent genital papilla. Looks like a quite a large penis. So, you find something with lots of spines and what looks like a penis, that's a male, long spine sea scorpion. And please do always call them sea scorpions. I've had a lot of problems uh, with people saying, I found a scorpion fish. This is a scorpion fish. 
unlike the um, the sea scorpions, in the Mediterranean, these can be in very shallow coastal water, but in British waters, they're usually offshore. Those spines on the back are venomous and also spines on the opercular plate. Uh, this species, the red scorpion fish, turns up one to three a year. Some years none, not year three. Uh, however, I found a much rarer sort, the black scorpion fish, of which I've got four definite records ever in Britain, went on to MBN Gateway and there were 12. One I checked, oh, quite a lot on the shore of, of uh, the Solent. Um, somebody had been told that the fish they found was a scorpion fish rather than a sea scorpion and had looked up the scientific name on the internet for a scorpion fish and put into their records uh, scorp a scorpina porcus which is an incredibly rare scorpion fish in Britain. So if you're not certain about the scientific name, do please stick to the common name if you know that. I recently had a record of a spotted ray and the scientific name was a tropical stingray. Obviously the English name was correct, but the um, it was in fact Montague's Raja Montague. Um, but um, it had been given the incorrect scientific name just by looking up the English name on the internet. So please be wary of that. Not exactly a shore fish. One with three dorsal fins, two anal fins, obviously a member of the cod family. Curved lateral line is the pollock. Pollock with an A. Pollock with an O is the American name for the safe or a coal fish or coley. The English Pollock has an A. But the youngsters do get found amongst intertidal kelp or just but subtidally. This beautiful one found down, I think, in the Solent, somewhere in that area shows a wonderful coloration. I've never seen one as bright as this, but usually silvery or slightly bluey with gold, where this bright orange is, it would normally be more goldy. And right on the shore, you get the early stages like this little one, which we caught in a push net down, I think it was at Mothercombe. You wouldn't know it to look at them, but other members of the cod family are the rocklings. So if you see something brown and eel-like wiggling through the weed, it could be an eel, but it could be a rockling. Amazing thing with the rocklings is they have a first dorsal fin here, which is all just loose spines, but it's vibrating extremely rapidly. You actually have to look very carefully to see it. That first dorsal fin is vibrating at a tremendous rate. The second dorsal fin is made up of soft rays and extends most of the length of the body. Totally two totally different fins there. Uh, they have barbels and it's usually by the arrangement of the barbels you can tell the species. Here, the uh, five bearded rockling two pairs of barbels on the upper lip and a single one below the mandible. That's, it varies on the south coast here, it varies from beach to beach, which is the commoner, the five bearded or the shore rockling. Shore rockling, one pair of uh, barbels on the upper jaw and a single one under the chin. Uh, you can see here again the groove where those vibrating spines are. More commonly, that grey one is unusual, and more commonly they are this warm brown colour. And most of the shores I go on, I tend to find the shore rockling commoner, but there's no other ones, it's the other way around. 
So you just have to look and sort them out. Uh, because they've got three barbels, sure rocklings sometimes get called a three bearded rockling, but they're not. This is a three bearded rockling. It can grow to be quite a large fish. Going around the fish market, I often see a box of these up for sale. I think they're quite good, decent eating. They're mainly subliteral, but actually I've found that in the Sillies, sorry, in the Isles of Scilly, um, they are generally, they, some of these things do occur in the littoral, in the shore, uh, including uh, the three bearded rockling. Unusual to find it on the shore, but one or two other fish you don't normally find on the shore, you do in Scilly. This is one, uh, I've ne I know of no records of the adult being found on the South Devon coast. It has been found around South Wales, but studies on the plankton have found the eggs and larvae of the northern rockling off Plymouth. The distinctive feature here is it's got the three barbels, but it's also got these little polyps along the upper lip. So if anyone finds one of those, please, please do let me know. That'd be a headliner. And this little fellow, silvery below, gorgeous greeny silvery above, gets the term mackerel midge. And in the late summer, you quite like to find these swimming around in a rock pool. Obviously, the young of some pelagic fish. Well, no, they're actually young rocklings. Totally different appearance. The mackerel midge is a young rockling. Moving on to eels. This is the common eel, the one you find in rivers and ponds. Um, they land on our shores as little tiny elvers, and you'll find them at uh, oh, about six uh, centimeters as just turning into a young eel. But they can stay on. This one was about 30 centimeters just in the mud and the weeds on the, in the Plym estuary. The thing with a uh, way to tell these is the position of start of the dorsal fin. In a European eel, Anguilla anguilla, the dorsal fin starts about a third or more of the way back down the body. In the conga, the dorsal fin starts just behind the tip of the pectoral fin. If you push the pectoral fin back to there uh, and just back, that's the start of the dorsal fin. So the conga, the dorsal fin extends much further along the body towards the head than it does in the, um, in the uh, normal anguilla eel. Congas can go to this kind of size. The pattern seems to be that they first settle into rock pools and are found on the shore up until around 12, 14 centimetres. And then they go deeper and they appear to go deeper, deeper, deeper as they get bigger. If you find a conga or catch, because it'd be in deeper water, a conga over about a metre, the chances are it's female. They breed in deep water off um, in the west, sorry, in the eastern Atlantic, northeast Atlantic, in about 4,000 metres. But the males go back to the breeding grounds when they're about <coughs> a metre to metre and a quarter long. The females <coughs> will stay in our waters and can go over three metres, uh, up to 50 kilos or more, whereupon they lose their teeth, they develop cataracts in their eyes, and their bones soften. All they're left with is muscle and gonad. And in that uh, form, they swim back to their breeding grounds and breed for the only time in their life. A conga in British waters has never bred. 
eel-like, but very distant from the eels, these little beauties. Often you'll find them under weed on the shore. And if you find one, look around, because there's usually two of them together. It's a pipefish. And that little, it's a very short snout for a pipefish and upturned. I find them absolutely delightful. And whenever you are taking in, uh, fish out of the water, and you do often need to, unfortunately, to identify them, check them out, make sure you get your hands wet first. Always wet your hands before you think about handling fish. So this little worm pipe fish on my hand here with that short upturned snout. Another fish you'll occasionally find on the shore. It mainly comes onto the shore at high water, but um, does occur on the shore. And we'll come back to that, is the corkwing wrasse. Uh, corkwing wrasse, one of the many wrasses found in the shallow coastal waters, very similar to the fairly rare Balon's wrasse. Uh, but Balon's in breeding season has a slightly longer pink snout. But the one distinctive feature People talk about the spots here, but I've seen plenty of corkwing without that spot being clearly marked. But this dark crescent behind the eye is what distinguishes a corkwing wrasse from any other. Otherwise, they can look a bit like a rock cook and a ballon wrasse, of course, can look like anything on Earth. Um, the Cornish sucker or shore clingfish, one you're probably familiar with, turn over rocks and you'll find it, the duck build shape. Uh, and those two lovely blue eye spots surrounded by this pattern of pale lines, ever so easy to identify. Well, down at Wembury, on a porcupine uh, marine natural society field meeting, Francis Dipper and I found this one. It's got all the pale lines around but the blue spots are so faint that you can't discern them. So do look at all the features, not just one. And another lovely feature, which you won't see when the fish is on your hand like this, that's very distinctive of the shore clingfish, Cornish sucker, is these nostril tentacles. It's the only one of the shore of the clingfish fish to have it. And it's lovely, distinctive. Get it in a bit of water and there they are. Uh, the clingfish in general are quite hard to identify. The um, Connemara clingfish is fairly similar to the <coughs> uh, shore clingfish, slightly shorter snout, tends to be green in colour rather than these rich browns. I think it looks a bit like a crocodile if you look at the edge of the lips. They've got kind of lot, lots of speckling marks along the edge of the lips. But it's recently pointed out to me that they can easily be distinguished by red radiating lines in the uh, cornea, in the um, pupil, not pupil, iris, in the iris. Uh, the two small ones, the small headed clingfish and the two spot clingfish, a male two spot will have at least one big dark blob just behind its pectoral fin. The female doesn't. And to distinguish that from a small headed, I find virtually impossible. The main characteristic is check the teeth. So unless you've got one, really you have to kill the fish to check the teeth to distinguish those two species. I hope to look into it further, see if there's other features like the caudal peduncle and things like that, the tail base, you can distinguish them. But basically those two, I don't try to identify from photos. Lump sucker, great big sucker for uh, sticking onto rocks. So that's obviously where it lives. No, most of the year, lump suckers are pelagic. They're swimming around in open water and spoke to one fisherman who was trying to um, midwater trawl for bass at one time. And he towed for three hours. And he caught three fish. I can't remember what one of them was. And he, one of them was a bass and one was a lump sucker. 
and that was trawling in mid water. I went round the San Marlo Aquarium and there they had a group of them in a tank and they were swimming around as a shoal in the top of the water. However, they do breed on the seabed. And here's some of the young, absolutely gorgeous little young ones. I've been walking around at Hannifer in southeast Cornwall and had several of these swimming around my wellies around me. Beautiful little greens and the same up at um, Cullicott's in Northumberland. But th this is what they then turn into. Before they turn into the adult, they're this little spiny one. And the fishermen in the Scilly were complaining to me, those damn fish in the autumn, they're all on our uh, boy ropes, on the ropes down to our crab pots. You try putting them up when they're covered in weed and you don't see these things and they cut your hands to pieces. Uh, the only flatfish you'll find on a rocky shore. And I was called into the fish market to say, Doug, we've got a fish we've never seen before. And it was a top knot. Now, divers will tell you they're common. And you may even find them on the shore if you turn over rocks. But divers see them stuck upside down on the underside of overhangs. So if you want to find top knots, always look underneath the rocks, whether it's a fixed rock and you're snorkeling, you have to look up or turn things over. But the top knot, there's three types of top knot. This is the only one you'll find on the shore. And I find it distinctive with this bandit mask. Uh, these are what we call left eyed flatfish. Flatfish start out like round fish, but as they develop, the eyes migrate due to differential growth of the bones to one side of the head or the other. And once they're adult, most are either left or right. I say most. Flounder in some areas, 30% can be, uh, not, flounder's normally right-eyed, but in some areas, 30% can be left-eyed. And when I was looking for a picture of a megrim recently, which is a left-eyed fish, the only one I could find was of a right-eyed one. So um, it's not foolproof but it's a good guide. Right, moving on from the rocks to the sand and mud. Sand eels. If you want to find sand eels, get your spade out and go digging. It's one of those fish you have to dig for. Sand eels and occasionally weavers you'll get if you dig in the sand. This lesser sand eel uh, fairly pointy snout. Well, they've all got pointy snouts, long things. Fairly undistinguished. This is the lesser, it's one of the commonest ones in our waters. In the North Sea, the very closely related Amadisus marinus, rates uh, sand eel, is found in large quantities to the extent, I think uh, Denmark had a quota one year for a million tonnes of sand eels from the North Sea. They didn't catch it. But that was their quota. And what they were doing, they were pressing them for oil and using the pressed ones as meal, either for animal feed, or if it wasn't, they burned them in power stations. So that's a sand deal. Um, also, oh, yeah, you have to be quick taking your photos. If you're not quick taking the photos, this is all you get. They bury into the sand in a blink of three eyes. This is the greater sand eel. They tend to be further off, in, still in shallow water, but not actually on the shore very often, but you might find them on the shore. They're larger when they're adult. They often look very green and they're distinguished by this dark spot on the upper jaw. The two species, or uh, closely related species, you actually have to look at the teeth of the vulva, the upside of the mouth, to uh, separate them for certain. But um, the, this is the one you're more likely to find. The greater sand deal. Look for bigger, more substantial fish, dark spot on the snout, and greenish coloration. 
You can all see the fish there, can't you? There we are, a brill. Pretty common on the shore, the post larval young brill. Pretty common on the shore. Um, very round looking. And I can't see, I think. Yeah, I think that's the anal fin and that's the dorsal fin. In which case, this part of the dorsal fin in a brill, the rays are separated and give it a frill like appearance. So if it's got a frill, it's a brill. And that's the uh, dorsal first few rays of the dorsal fin. Very similar, but more diamond shaped, is the turbot. And once they're this size and a lot bigger, gently run a wet finger over the back and you can find lots of little bony tubercles, little bony lumps on the back, which tell you straight away that it's a turbot. More typical flatfish shape. And this one, of course, those last two were both left-eyed. A right-eyed one is the place. Um, usually got orange spots, a very strong ridge between the eyes. Strong ridge between the eyes, orange spots, getting more pronounced as it gets bigger. Yes, another one there. Once again, the orange spots aren't that distinctive there but the ridge between the eyes, a general shape, general appearance. Uh, place spawning areas are known to be off the north coast of Cornwall and North Devon. So not surprising, we get quite a lot of youngsters on our shores. They come in and they use our beaches as nursery areas. This is a flounder. Uh, very similar in general appearance, and they can occasionally have orange spots or blotches, uh, but do it doesn't have the strong ridge between the eyes, but has a ridge behind the eyes. And the easy way to tell uh, a flounder, if you've got one big enough to touch, is along the base of the dorsal and of the anal fin, the basis of the fin rays are bone, uh, got bony lumps. So if you run your finger along and there's little bony knobs there, that is a flounder. <coughs> Sand sole. The books tell you to look at the nostrils on the other side. One is much bigger with a flowery edge than the other. But I find this uh, pectoral fin here on the eye side is very distinctive. In a sole, it's brown with a solid black tip. In a sand sole, it's dark in the adult, not so dark in the juvenile, but with a wedge of white or cream or yellow in there, a V-shaped wedge of colour in the uh, pectoral fin there. So that's your pectoral fin, pelvic fins down here, typical sole shape. And of course, the famous one of the rocky shore, of the sandy shore, the lesser weaver. Uh, stand on one and you'll know it. Treat with um, water as hot as you can stand. Not boiling water, unless you want to have scald that's worse than the sting. Uh, the old fisherman's tale was that the sting, the pain of the sting would last a tide. In other words, six hours. Um, but it's a protein uh, toxin, therefore water as hot as you can stand will help to denature, break down the toxin and aid your recovery. It's not a very good photo, but it does show the crucial feature, this dorsal fin, which is the poisonous, the venomous uh, part of it. The thing is, of course, when you tread on it, your own weight will squeeze that into your foot and squeeze the venom glands at its base, forcing the venom up along grooves in the fin into your foot. Uh, basically, they lay hidden in the sand. They're ambush predators. 
So they're cryptically hidden in the sand, that giant mouth just waiting there to come out and grab a uh, passing shrimp. When we did the bio blitz up at Woolacombe uh, a few years back, did some seine netting, and I turned around to one of the uh, beach wardens afterwards said, do you get weavers here? Oh yeah, we get three or four each summer. I said, we've caught 24 today. They tend to be found at low water spring tides and on a beach that gets a little bit of surf. That seems to be the best place to find them or the best place to be wary of them. So wear uh, some shoes on your feet if you're going into that kind of area. Uh, that black fin, a story I've been told, I've got no proof of it, but it does make sense is that the black tip of the pectoral fin of the common or Dover sole is black. And somebody said to me, ah, that's because they lay on the sand and they keep raising it to make other fish think it's a weaver fish, and therefore they won't attack them. So is the black tip of the pectoral fin of the common sole a mimicry? I'm sure Roger can tell me the type of military, mimicry. Um, of the venomous fin, warning fin of the weaver. Tend to find them when we're seine netting, but never that as numerous in Britain. Whenever I go over to France or Spain and look down into a harbour, the water is just full of shoals of sand smelt. In Britain, we get quite a lot. We've caught them in the plim and most places we've been uh, seine netting, but uh, never as abundant. They're very sensitive, have to be handled very carefully, keep them in the water if possible. This one just taken out for a second for, a photo, uh, photo, for the photograph. And as I say, must be handled with a wet hand. But lovely little fish. Uh, I'm told that a lot of what is now sold as white bait, white bait traditionally should be young sprats or herrings or even young sardines, is now smelt, sand smelt. Don't confuse with this smelt, which is has a much larger mouth and large teeth and found out at sea or up in estuaries where it breeds. And the smelt has a distinctive smell of cucumber. The sand smelts don't. Not at all related. Sand smelt has two dorsal fins. The smelt has one dorsal fin and one adipose fin. So two dorsal fins and swimming in shore around here is like to be a sand smelt. On to tricky group, the uh, gobies. Painted goby is normally fairly distinctive. This one particularly so, being a male in full breed, breeding colours. But even in the females and the juvenile, the first dorsal fin shows very marked uh, banding across it. And you usually get this pattern of dark spots along the flank. So dark spots along the flank, striping on the fin, like to be a painted goby. Painted gobies I tend to find where there's strong water movement, either in areas of strong current or quite often where you've got a river running across the beach, going out to sea you often find where it's more the gravelier part of the river a uh, little stream will have painted gobies. The side at the sandier parts at the side like to get common gobies. This is a sand goby. Sand gobies tend to be more on the coast rather than up estuaries. You can get them in estuaries as well, but um, coast, you're more likely to be sand gobies estuary more like to be common gobies. Had to say sand or lozanos. The sand, the lozanos and also the Norwegian, which is tend to be found deeper, are very difficult to, uh, to uh, distinguish without microscopic examination. So sand or lozanos. This is a sand. Lynn Baldock, as I say, together with Paul Kay, has done a fantastic study of these, there was a brilliant article in the Porcupine magazine on it. Um, 
and this is a particularly well marked one. General appearance, eyes there. The one of the features you can use to identify them is the extent to which the scales are on the head. But for you just looking at them casually, it's going to be difficult. This spot here, lots of the books say you only get it in the male. But this is a female and it's got it. And I don't think it's a sexually distinctive character. So there's your sand goby. And there's a common goby. Here, you can just see a dark mark on that fin, just the same. There's supposed to be a dark mark in the base of the pectoral fin in the axilla, but I haven't noticed it myself. You can see here, it's shown in this diagram, but notice the dark spot on that. It's not always there. If it's there, it's in the rear part of the first dorsal fin, but it's low. So in the Sangobi, the spot is high or distal in the books. In the common goby, it is proximal. Also, look at the scale count along the lateral line, 58 to 70, 59 to 52. I hate counting scales and I wouldn't do it unless I really had to. But what it does tell you the scales on a sangobi to get 70 in similar distance are small they're medium size on a common goby but the feature i find most distinctive is the snout length much shorter and stubbier on the common goby and here we have common goby pomocystis uh, microps on the left sand goby on the right, and you can see the difference in the snout lengths there. All gobies have a pectoral disc, uh, pelvic disc, sorry. Um, and this is the one of the sand goby. Probably not a great deal of difference with the common. A goby that's apparently quite common, but we all tend to overlook because it's transparent, is the crystal goby. There's this and the transparent goby both do occur in our waters. They're small, they're transparent, so easily overlooked. It's just the eyes, and I think it's the liver here, uh, which it, it might be the swim bladder. Do gobies have swim bladder? I'm not certain. Uh, which is pigmented. Otherwise, it could just swim past you and you wouldn't see it. On the, in shallow water, dragonets. The dragonets in shallow waters tend to be young ones. And so smallish like this, they can grow to 30, 35, 40 centimeters and get distinctive bright colors in the males. But on the shore, you're gonna find small ones like this. Um, it is possible to identify them by the markings on the back, but it's fairly difficult. The characteristic feature is supposed to be the spines on the preoperculum here. And you really need a microscope and usually a piece of card behind them to separate them. Uh, three species uh, spotted. Uh, oh, well. Maculatus, well, spotted, reticulate, spotted and common. And this is probably the common. There again. Lovely patterns on them. And that arrow shaped head, flattened arrow shaped head, eyes well forward. In the eelgrass, this, the marine sea or 15 spine stickleback. These actually nest in amongst weed or sea or eelgrass, same way as a three spine stickleback does in pond weed. And they do it by producing a glue from a gland in their kidneys and sticking the uh, weed together to make a nest, usually up off the bottom, but close to the bottom by sticking together 
uh, weed or uh, eelgrass to make a nest, which the male mates, in, in most of these fish, it's the male who does all the work, as in life. Um, and the male does the, builds a nest and guards the young. The uh, greater pipefish, very long snout, so different to the worm pipefish. And here, not only does the male, um, well, the male doesn't make a nest because he carries the eggs around in folds of skin along his belly. Another, those, that's one, that's, that is one of the biggest pipefish in British waters. The greater, the snake pipefish likewise can be very long. But this has a much softer rounded body, whereas the greater is hard uh, plated body. And their close relatives, the seahorses, hopefully won't find these on the shore. Um, if you do find one, you know, make sure it goes back into water as quickly as possible. If it's in a rock pool, leave it until the tide comes in. The short snouted I recognize the short snouted by this high crest always, a relatively short snout. And immature male or female, I can't tell, because the males carry the eggs in their pouch. And here, the other species we find in Britain with a much longer snout, but the head isn't so crested, has all these, may have all these spines, they can lose them but uh, spined or maned seahorse. And another fish you'll find in estuaries and amongst the seagrass are the gray mullets. Um, if you get the little ones, they're pretty hard to tell apart. But, uh, actually, we now, got, we now know we've got four species of gray mullet in Britain. We thought we had three, had one specimen of uh, the flat-headed mullet found oh, about 20 years ago in the Camel Estuary, and recently it's been refound in South Cornwall. Fish eggs and nests. The eggs of the shanny, very similar to those of the tompot blenny, will be under an overhang in the tompot and in the shanny. The males will guard these as they're developing. The black goby, he's found a nice place for his nest here inside a bit of uh, tubing. So the nest I found was just a muddy hollow in a muddy shell and, and black gobies do tend to be found much muddier areas. The rock goby on your rocky shore, if you're in a muddy estuary, you're going to suspect black goby first, obviously check it out. But the ones I found, the eggs were on the underside of a rock in a puddle on the, in the mud. Rock goby have lovely eggs. Here you can see them. These torpedo, elliptical shaped eggs, with the eyes there as they develop. The male will make sure they're fanned and also any that die, he'll eat to stop them spreading infection to the others in the group. These also I find beautiful eggs. Look at all the facets on them. Uh, these are the eggs of the long spine sea scorpion. And what's this, a nest on the shore? I, this trip I was over on Lundy, and I said to the warden, do you get, uh, Corkwing wrasse nesting on the shore here? Oh, don't think so. I went down and I found about three of these. They're always in the shaded area in a sheltered patch. And they start off making the nest with soft algae and then put old, uh, tougher ones on the outside, usually ending up with Coralina officinalis, which is lovely in camouflage when they put it on fresh. But after it's been on a while, it dies and gets bleached and often you'll see it showing as a white patch like this. So the male builds the nest. He'll do a display outside it to attract a female. See how good a nest I've built. Whereupon the female comes up. Yeah, decent job. Goes in, lays her eggs. He fertilizes them. She goes off. 
he covers it with fresh algae and goes out and finds another young lady. Come and see at my lovely nest. Wouldn't you like to leave your eggs in this? And they can have up to five females lay their eggs in the same nest. The males will defend that nest an extremely territorial at high water. If a snorkeler goes up to it, they'll come out and try and chase them off. But at low water, they leave the nest, leave its, its own moisture, keeping the eggs clear, and they'll actually become social in a group of males in the sea. But as soon as the tide changes, they're territorial again. Oh, sorry, have I gone backwards? Uh, no, that's uh, yeah, another view of a nest. There's some seaweed here with a nest under it. A lump sucker nest with the cock uh, fish guarding it. The male lump sucker develops this red belly in the breeding season and he will stay on the shore, usually subliterally. This was taken in May in Northumberland. I believe around this area, they tend to nest in February, March, and probably subliterally. But this was at low water spring tides in Northumberland in May, and he's just sitting there amongst the eggs, guarding them. That's the cock lump sucker. And there's what the nest looks like otherwise. All those eggs there. And I mentioned the uh, greater pipefish carrying uh, its eggs under folds of skin along the belly. The worm pipefish, actually, and all same the snake pipefish, I presume the straight nosed pipefish, uh, all actually stick the eggs onto a sticky pad on the mouse belly. And there's your male worm pipefish. Most of the ones you find on the shore at the moment are probably going to have eggs on their bellies. As I said earlier, you often find them sticking together as a pair on the shore. And I mentioned the viviparous blenny. These are the young. It gives birth to live young. These are the young from a viviparous blenny. These are taken from a study that was done up on the East Coast. I did, um, Mike was telling me earlier, he'd found a new nudibranch today he hadn't seen before. Well, this is one to look out for. Calma gobiophagia. Well, the scientific name tells you what it eats. Gobi and oophage means egg eating. They feed on the eggs of the gobies. So here's your Calma gobiophagia, uh, a nudibranch that lives on goby eggs. Uh, people often ask me what books are useful for identifying fish. The one with the wealth of knowledge in that most other books are based on is Alwyn Wheeler's 1965 or 68 uh, Fishes of British Isles and Northwest Europe. Obviously, some names have changed, some facts have been found out, a lot of facts have been found out since then, but still, it's the first source. Similarly, uh, any fish that turn up in British waters are likely to be in this book, three volume, Fishes of Northeast Atlantic and Mediterranean, produced by UNESCO in the 1970s. But for use in uh, everyday use, uh, Francis Dipper and Paul Kay produced the Marine Fishes of Wales, which is very much a diver's book. And most of the photos are taken of the fish underwater in their habitats. Very good. I find sometimes you can't see the distinction characters you, you need in it, and it doesn't quite cover everything. But very good book to use and good photos. Done from the other point of view, claims to be comprehensive of all fish found in British coastal waters. It isn't, but still extremely um, full coverage, but done from the scientist and the, and the um, commercial fisherman's point of view. Many of the photos in this are taken of fish aboard vessels, 
after they've been caught. And so um, a different perspective. The two together make a good pair. But of course, if you want one that covers every fish that have been known to have occurred in British waters up to about 2008, it's the key to marine fish. These are just line drawings. They're not colorful ones, but hopefully the text covers a lot of uh, that. It was done in a rush in 2008, nine, and the environment, for the Environment Agency, they only printed 300 copies, but you can get a PDF of it. If anyone wants one, let me know. I can send you the link to get a PDF of it. Um, those three together cover most things, but a few fish have turned up even since that book, since all, both, all three of those books came out. They will probably be found, any ones that are missing from those books are likely to be found in this one. Uh, the first edition of this one was only in French, but very useful. But it does cover its colour photographs, mainly from divers, of pretty well every fish found in uh, the marine waters of Europe, Mediterranean up to Norway. And for local use, when you're just looking in the rock pools, uh, Julie and Steve's uh, guide to rock pooling will cover a lot of it and give you a lot of information. Also, uh, covering much fewer species, but giving a lot of lovely photos and um, information about the fish is Paul Naylor's Great British Marine Animals. So just to finish off, a few oddities. The boar fish turns up on the shore from time to time. A friend found one swimming around in a rock pool in Wembury. Oh, it's a rare fish, isn't it? Well, no, not actually. Uh, the, the commercial fisherman's name for it is Zulu. And I thought it was because of its bright color. And one of the fishermen said, no, don't be daft. It's because when you get one of them, it's like this in the film. If you get one, there's millions of them. And there's a, a trawl coming in in the sillies. Uh, yeah, sorry, ours are silly, uh, with um, a net full of them. And in fact, they found in such large quantities at one time off the west coast of Ireland, they actually started fishing for them with the intention of catching 800,000 to a million tons for fish meal. So the boar fish or Zulu uh, is fairly common in places, but quite rare on our shores. I quite often get sent photos of baby flying fish. Now, the first one of these I found was when I was um, push netting up at um, north coast of Cornwall, at Polzeth. And when we looked at it, it was a young gurnard. But most of these appear to be, in fact, young. I can never tell because the photo is always taken from above. And you need a side picture to get the profile of the head to tell the gurnard from a young blenny. These are young blennies. See those enormous pectoral fins. You can see why they get called young uh, flying fish. And that's of course gurnards have enormous pectoral fins. So you can see a young, uh, young gurnard does have equally prominent pectoral fins. So one of those could be either if it's need a photo from the side, if it's um, <coughs> concave head profile, it's a gurnard. If it's convex, it's a blenny. Uh, hi, Doug. Doug, can I just say we need to finish off soon because we need some time for. Yep, Q sure. Just, I think this is my last. These are little deep um, mesopelagic yeah. fish that sometimes turn up. The pearl, they, they've got little light cells underneath. That's one that was found on the shore, but up in Northumberland. Apparently, they're very rare south of Whitby, but north of Whitby, they're common. And it's a hagfish, oh. fish without a backbone. And I used to say that a friend of mine caught the biggest rock pool fish ever. He was a guide on Galapagos and found a, uh, a skipjack tuna in a rock pool. Well, this big eye tuna, which is even bigger, was found in a rock pool down in Cornwall. 
and that to my knowledge is the biggest rock pool fish soon ever. I think you can guess what happened to it from the background so I didn't get to examine it but it's a big eye tuna that was found in a rock pool in Cornwall. As I say I've stolen the photos from lots of people I thanks to them and there we are. 